it that again tie into the stories that, that are explored in the work? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a little artist, K.I. J. Young, who, um, who provided some of the structures that are in the bar area, and she appears as a barmaid in the film. And that's some of those objects, the sculptures that she made, are supposed to reference. Uh, well, in my mind, there's, there's a reference to the looting of the museum, as, as if it's some future date. Yeah, exactly. uh, there's some huge um, revolution or major upheaval, and so, so yeah, the museums and looters are so it's as if uh, these are the remnants of that process. But I think because because the the <coughs> seems to be a some derelict cinema, and almost you're just going in there with the expertise and using it, it looks as if they should be part of the. Um, the leftovers to try to solve of the shutdown cinema, but actually they're not. You've placed them very carefully in quite a sort of art historically symbolic way. Sort of, you know, I look at it 300 years ago, 400 years ago, Dutch symbolist painting, still like and all the props that have extra um, meaning. Right. In so when um, I watch yeah. it again, I notice more each time. And sort of added, right, and it's about writing how much work there is involved in making the work and the fact that every tiny element, which might seem just coincidental, yeah, just that should be carefully selected by you. Um, I think that's really interesting. And again, the, you mentioned about the, this future event that may or may not be about looting museums. Again, that's another reason why I responded to the work of the collection. Um, and it's, it's just an extra little bit that I think is really interesting, that you don't really hear much of a lot of art, but it's um, that kind of... Um, Again, harking back to the fact that the cinema is called the futures and the work's called the futures. But again, you still don't know at what point in time they're talking about um, how far off um, so there's a date of 2000. Yeah, the maybe a date mentioned. Yeah. Um, Just like a voice from the screen, is it? It's a news bulletin. But you're still not really sure where you are in time, so you're not sure if it's present day, if it's 50 years ago. Um, and I think it's, it's that playing around with history that I, I think is really interesting. Um, and also memory and the, the, the way that those props and those objects can, can sort of spark memories. Um, and I wanted you to talk a little bit more about your um, real focus, I think, particularly works in this show, about memory and the way that we remember. Um, and without getting too philosophical, I suppose, about, about why that appeals to you, particularly in your work, yeah. which has been there for quite a long time now. Sure, I mean, it's, it's, it kind of explains uh, partly the, the kind of fragmentary nature of the, um, the futurist plot, or the experience of watching it, as you were saying, and to some extent about the new piece as well. Um, I suppose I, I can start off with, there's a, a text in, in the book, here. I've, I've done a book, of, uh, it's like a collection of um, some uh, scripts, but some of the pieces specially written um, as, as kind of stories or, or text to be part of a collection of stories. There's one called The Pox in Your Guts that was quite influenced by a George Orwell novel called Coming Up For Air. And there's a moment in, in the Orwell novel where the, the main character is walking down the Strand in London, I think it is, and just sees a newspaper Hoarding. It's, it says something about a king in Africa, King Zog or something like that, some bizarre name, it's, it's just died. <clears throat> and it suddenly triggers this, this amazing kind of rapture of memory that he suddenly experiences in this ordinary walk down a London street. Because, it, the, because the name is kind of similar to some of the names that occurred in sermons. Uh, when he went to church when he was a child. So it sounded a bit like Zachariah or uh, one of those biblical names. So he's suddenly back in his childhood and kind of immersed in this process of memory without having any control of it in some ways. And it's, it's a sort of involuntary process. It's not uh, a, f a fixed <coughs> uh, relationship to the past where you, where you choose to 
explore a particular subject and, and that subject seems fixed and you're fairly fixed in relation to it that everything is, is quite stable. It's, it's a very subjective, very kind of emotional experience and, and very personal experience. So I think I've always been interested in the past and how we, we it, ever since I was an art student, I was making paintings about historical moments. But I, even then I was interested in the kind of difficulty of, of trying to try to represent those moments. It's always a bit absurd. And there's, an, there's a conventional 19th century history painting is, is the sort of paradigm of that and that absurdity in a way, this idea that, that you can suddenly um, uh, reinvent this moment in, in its truth somehow. So, um, so part of the, the difficulty of, of, of bringing the past into the present is, is how we represent it as those means by which we, those forms of representation uh, are kind of flawed and uh, are always uh, inadequate in some ways to, to really engage with those moments. But uh, I think the, the extreme version of that is, is our own personal engagement with, with memory, I suppose. It's, it's a kind of, it's the, yeah, the most extreme relationship with, with history, history and that instability that, that we have. And we can't control our memories as well, so we can pick one object and for no apparent reason and then it comes to mind and it goes to the memory and that it's that jumping around from one to another that I think it does come across through some of the work. And I remember when I was a student <coughs> and I was um, in a lecture, I think it was an archaeologist story, who was, was, was talking about um, notions of history and his, you know, uh, explained to us that history is just the way we choose to remember events. And I'd never have thought about it that way before. But it is because you have a group of people, all at the same events, same thing happening. Go and interview them all, all have a different experience of that event, and it's, it is completely subjective. Once I started thinking about history and the way they should record such a thing, paintings or in, in books or in texts, it is completely subjective down to the person who's chosen to remember that, and sometimes it's the memory selecting for them. And it is only what we choose or memories are chosen to remember. And I had a bit of a um, moment then when I realised what Lich was trying to explain to us and I'd never thought of that before. And that history is skewed and it always will be because as a someone with their own personality and their own <coughs> memory choosing to record that moment in history, even if it was documentary, you still got somebody choosing to stand at that yeah, particular place. That There's always some way of yeah, manipulating um, events. And, that's one of the things that I think is really interesting about the work is, is thinking about the past and the way we do remember. Um, sometimes a bit scary when you start to think that actually you've got no control sometimes over your memories and that it is completely subjective um, sure. and there's no science to it. But also I think in some ways um, the past is quite often seen as exactly the opposite. Um, you know, you, you could argue certain nations even, or, or cities, uh, construct a sort of a past that, that is, is about, um, it's about identity as well as it's, it's, about, it's about securing yourself in the world. It's, it's about, and if you talk about the, how uh, the past of Liverpool is being used to, as part of the regeneration of the city, and so mm -hmm. that's all really interesting. Um, but in all of this, it's quite difficult when you start introducing more unstable kind of ideas or, or maybe ideas that the past isn't necessarily uh, always a force for, for the better. You know, the, the senses, maybe just going back to, to personal psychological encounters with, with you know, and so on. Um, but, Events that have happened in, in an individual's past can, can actually distort their, their approach to the present. And, you know, and psychologically, and um, unless yeah, unless you find ways of, of embracing it or, or dealing with it, it's not.
ones, but I mean, you could argue that the same in terms of the way a nation or a city can be counters. It's past the, some elements of it that it's, it isn't going to be able to control and can actually unsettle um, the present in, in unpredictable ways. I suppose the unpredictability is, is the opposite to that solidity that, that people think of in, in relation to the past. Partly because the past is finished, so people think of it as fixed in some way. It's an event that has happened, so it's never going to change. But what I'm trying to say is that, that there's elements that we uh, can encounter every day, and it's it's how that encounter happens that creates that instability. So it's not that the, the past is constantly changing; it's it's our view of it. And the things that we choose to ignore about it, yeah, and think about it, and deliberately sometimes choose to <coughs> ignore. Um, and yeah, and some places like that, those seat tinted glasses, you know, you remember quite often the good points or something, and you forget some of the bad points, or vice versa. You, some particularly that you, you <coughs> really affected you terribly, actually. If we thought the time base it's not that bad, but you've chosen, you've been affected so bad that you can't get away from it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think some elements of that in the future is. Um, and also Mackenzie, which you'll see something in our show. Um, I, I, um, Mackenzie's work that Paul made, which is our book. That's it. Yeah, um, it's on the book. Um, which was focused around there's a, a old um, monument tombstone in a uh, graveyard on Rodney Street, which is a pyramid. And um, if you ever go on a bus tour, and Paul will quite often take you past there and mention Mackenzie. And I'll do that. You do, yeah. I, when I first came, I went with Doctor and I went past him, he stopped outside, and he told me that. And he said, Look at the pyramid shaped tombstone, why I think it's a pyramid. And it's because um, uh, Mackenzie made a pact with the devil um, to win a gambling card game. And so his pyramid, his tomb is pyramid shaped. And Paul we'll used that as inspiration for um, another work, not an actual show. But again, there's that. Um, with Mackenzie, which is a real story, and um, also you've used that as an inspiration in work. Again, that yeah. that's a myth. It's a real myth. A real myth. Yeah, but but he he did something that he agreed <coughs> would affect his his death is that point. Um, and and again, it's that. Um, I suppose you again looking into the way that we um, things we can do now can affect the past, the past, affect the future. Um, but in a completely different way. Um, and I would love to have that initial, but we'll be pretty watching. Um, yeah.